This morning we continue in the book of Luke. We're going to be looking at uh, Luke chapter 9 verses 51 through 62. This passage begins the second section of Luke's gospel. This middle section is a travel narrative and it's based more on Jesus' teaching than Jesus' actions. I would love for you to follow along in your Bibles. It's on page 1027 of the Pew Bibles. I'm not going to read the passage, but I am going to speak to the story as we go through it. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessing of studying it. We pray that your Holy Spirit will move here among us, within us, teaching us what you have for us today. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, this passage has two sections. The first section has to do with the Samaritan countries, Samaritan area. The second has to do with three possible disciples. So as we begin, verse 51 through 56 talks about the beginning of this journey and what happens in Samaria. In verse 51, we read that Jesus sets his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus has a plan, he has a direction, he has a mission, and he's not going to vary from it. And so we read that he is prepared to go to Jerusalem. He sets his face there. In verse 52, we read that as they are traveling through the Samaritan lands, and we need to remember that the Samaritans and the Jews by and large hated one another, but faithful Jews on their way to Jerusalem to participate in the Holy Days would often need to pass through the Samaritan lands. In this case, Jesus sends two messengers to talk to the people in a Samaritan village to let them know that they're coming. This is a courtesy that says there are about 20, 30, maybe 40 of us coming to your village. Can you provide food? Can you provide accommodation for us? The two messengers go, but in verse 53 we learn that the Samaritans reject Jesus. The pronoun is specific. The Samaritans reject Jesus because he is heading to Jerusalem. Now there is a hatred that exists between Samaritans and Jews, but for whatever reason, these Samaritans in this village completely reject Jesus and say, we will not welcome you into this community. Well, in verse 4, we read about James and John. James and John have a solution. They know exactly what they should do. And so they ask Jesus, do you want us to call fire down from heaven? You want us to call fire down on this village, destroy the village, destroy its inhabitants? They were probably thinking of Elijah. They may have been thinking of 1 Kings 18, where Elijah brings down the fire to consume the sacrifice when he's in the contest, although it's no contest, with the prophets of Baal. Or they may have been thinking about 2 Kings uh, chapter 1, where Elijah calls down fire to destroy some of Ahaziah's soldiers. In any case, they say to Jesus, do you want us to do this? you want us to take care of this? Call down some fire. And Jesus turns to them. He says, look at me. Look at me. And then he rebukes them. Some translations offer specific language that Jesus uses. Most of the commentators think this is later language added in after the scriptures were being copied. But Jesus rebukes them. And then they travel to another village and they continue on the mission toward Jerusalem. And that's the first section of this scripture. The second section, verses 57 through 62, deal with three possible disciples. And in verses 57 and 58, we read about the first man. Luke tells us that a man, Matthew tells a very similar story, and in Matthew's account, this man is a scribe, Luke just says, a man comes to Jesus and says, I'll follow you. I'll follow you wherever you go. 
Whatever you do, I will follow you. Why? What's his motivation? Why does he say, I will follow you? It may be that he was looking for excitement. He may have thought there was some reward in, in following this rabbi. He may have thought things could turn out for, for him in a way that would be good. Maybe if this is the Messiah, maybe this is a chance to get in on the ground floor of this Messiah thing. For whatever reason, he says, Jesus, I'll follow you. I'll follow you anywhere. Jesus' response is interesting. Jesus says, you know, animals have a den. Animals have a place where they sleep. Birds have a nest. But the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. Do you understand what it means to follow me? Do you understand that to follow me doesn't mean that things are going to be comfortable, doesn't mean that things are going to be easy, doesn't mean that this is uh, something that you would undertake lightly. There is a cost, Jesus says, to following me. Does the man follow Jesus or not? Luke doesn't tell us. Verses 59 and 60 deal with the second man. And in this case, we read in the first part of verse 59 that Jesus, just as he did with the twelve, Jesus goes to the man and says, follow me. And in the latter part of verse 59, Jesus, the man uh, whom Jesus has invited says, I will, I want to follow you. First I need to bury my father, though. The commentators think there may be two possibilities here. One possibility is that the man's father has just died, and there's much to do. There are herbs to buy, there's cloth to buy to wrap the body, there are mourners to hire, there's all kinds of stuff that needs to be done. And the man says, in this scenario, the man says, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. I have a lot to do first, but when that's done, I will follow you. The other scenario that some of the commentators address feel that the man's father is probably dying, in the process of dying, and the man says, I will follow you, Jesus, but first I have to remain with my father, and when he dies, then I need to buy the herbs, and I need to buy the cloth, and I need to hire the mourners. I will follow you, Jesus, but not right now. There's other stuff I need to do, not now. And Jesus says, your priorities are wrong. You don't understand situation. Your priorities are confused. He says the physically dead can be buried by the spiritually dead. Jesus says you should go forward. You should go and proclaim the kingdom of God. The priority right now is in proclaiming the kingdom of God. Does the man follow Jesus or not? Luke doesn't tell us. Verses 61 and 62 bring us to the third man. In verse 61 we read that this man says, Yes, Jesus, I'll follow you, but first I need to go back home and say goodbye to the folks. I'll follow you. I just need to go back home. And Jesus says to him, You're like a man who's plowing. You have a plow. You're plowing that direction. You're like a man who's plowing, but looking back this way. It's like you're going this way, but you're paying attention the wrong way. Most of you know I grew up on a farm. My dad was a farmer by vocation. He couldn't do it as long as he wanted to, but he was a farmer by vocation. He loved to farm. He was a wonderful farmer. And two things he took pride in. He took pride in the fact that his rows were the straightest of anybody in the valley. And he took pride in the fact that there was never a weed anywhere on his ditches. Other farmers might spend their farming time in the coffee shop. My dad made sure his rows were straight and there were no weeds in the ditches. I'm not my father. I drove tractor a lot for my dad. He never trusted me with plowing, but I drove a disc a lot, drove the tractor pulling a disc a lot. 
And those rows, the, my dad's farm was a half mile by a quarter mile. And so I would sight a fence post a quarter mile away, line it up with the smokestack of the tractor, and I would say, I'm going to drive straight as a die toward that fence post. And then a bird would fly by. Or a rabbit would pop up. Or I'd start thinking of something else, and the tractor would veer off this way, and then I'd correct it, and we'd be back this way. And it looked like a Van Gogh painting when I was finished. And every row, once you've made it curvy, you've got to keep going curvy. You can't straighten it out. So every one gets more exaggerated. Jesus says, you're like that. You're like that. You're looking backwards. You're not looking where you're going. Does the man follow Jesus or not? Luke doesn't tell us. I think we can take three things away from this text. The first has to do with James and John. See, we sometimes think it's up to us to protect the reputation of God Almighty. And the flaw in this thinking is that we're not paying attention to the name. God Almighty. If we believe what we claim to believe, God is not at risk. God is not at risk and God's reputation is safe and secure. See, James and John act as though Jesus is somehow being harmed by the rejection of this Samaritan village, and they seem to think they have the power, given the authority from Jesus, they have the power to produce heavenly fire, destroy these people. They seem to be saying, they can't say that. They can't say that to you. They must be punished, and we're just the guys to do it. My friends, I can't tell you the number of times I'm shocked and disappointed when people whom I respect, people I admire, people I love, who have clearly identified themselves in social media or in other kinds of communication as followers of Jesus Christ, when they say the most unkind, the most hateful, the most painful things in the name of God to people with whom they disagree. I will tell you that I honestly cringe when I see a brother or a sister engage in this behavior, and I readily admit that sometimes I myself engage in that kind of communication as well. And I give you permission I give every one of you permission to call me on that because that's not the follower of Jesus I desire to be. We need to stand with God. We need to follow Jesus. But God's reputation is not at risk. And we don't need to protect God's reputation. Jesus rebuked James and John for their approach, their solution to this situation. And then what did Jesus do? He found another village, a village that would offer accommodation, no fire from heaven, no blast of angry words, simply moving on to another place and keeping the mission the highest priority. I think that's the first point from this passage. The second is that Jesus invites us to count the cost. Invites us to count the cost of following him. My wonderful, wonderful father-in-law, late father-in-law, M.L. Berry, worked in an aircraft plant in a particular city, in a particular state. And in that company, it was well known that if you wanted to get ahead, if you wanted a promotion, if you wanted the better assignments, you had to attend a particular church. And before you get ahead of yourselves, the plant was not in Utah, and the church is not the church you're probably thinking it was. Given that this was a fairly big plant with a lot of employees, you can guess and you would be right that there were a lot of people from the plant sitting in the pews every Sunday morning. That's not unique. By the way, 
My father-in-law never got a promotion. And he led his family to a different church. See, in years past, although maybe not so much today, this church over here or that church over there was the place to attend if you wanted to meet the right kind of people, if you wanted to make the right kind of contacts. It may be, and I suspect it is the case, that as the church generally loses its standing in American culture, and the church is clearly losing its status, in the culture of America, I believe that fewer and fewer people will be in the pews because it's the socially acceptable place to be, and more and more will be gathered in churches because they have fallen in love head over heels with a carpenter's son from up in Nazareth. Some of the commentators, probably drawing from Matthew's description of this man as a scribe, have suggested that he wanted to be part of a movement with crowds and miracles and glitz and glitter. This is clearly only speculation, but Jesus makes clear to the man that there's no romantic element to this. There's no adventure in this journey. There's hardship and there's discomfort on the road ahead. What does the man do? Does he follow Jesus? And what do we do? If we know that our own journey will involve sacrifice, that it may involve the disorientation and even the disdain of friends, what will we do? Jesus wants us to count the cost of the journey, to know what may lie on the road before us. Well, we don't have to protect God's reputation, and Jesus wants us to count the cost of following him. But finally, Jesus wants us to be willing to accept the cost of following him. Jesus desires that we should follow him, even to the cross. The way of following Jesus requires us to put the kingdom ahead of our own desires, sometimes even our competing values. To follow Jesus is to be continually transformed into the person Jesus desires us to be. And those transformations are not always comfortable. Sometimes following Jesus requires a change in social status. And Jesus says, follow me. Sometimes following Jesus means giving up goals and pursuits that have enchanted us for years. And Jesus says, Follow me. You know, a person gets to be my age, and we tend to look back over the years. I look back at who I used to be and who I am and who I'm still becoming. I can look back and see how clear and distinct my opinions were about the good guys and the bad guys. I can see how in the past, I had a level of certainty about people's motives that's not so clear today. I can see that the degree of certainty in my rightness on some particular issue has given way to the possibility that I may have been wrong about some things and the people I was disagreeing with may have been right. It becomes more and more crystal clear to me that I need Jesus. I need grace, and I need to love others as God has loved me. And Jesus continues to say, John, follow me. My sisters and brothers, may we, you and I, learn the lessons of this passage May we worry less about protecting God's reputation, knowing that God is indeed almighty. May we daily count the cost of following Jesus. This morning, Jesus says to you, follow me. What will we do?
Amen.